From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Anne-Marie Hordern, I'm Joe Matthew. Two hours from now, President Biden will address the nation on the debt ceiling bill that's awaiting his signature. The House and the Senate have to do their business, and so we're going to work very quickly with them uh, to get this done, to make sure we can sign it uh, hopefully as soon as, as soon as tomorrow. We'll hear from senior advisor to the president, Gene Sperling. With the debt ceiling debate in the rearview mirror for now, we'll get a sense of how voters view the months-long controversy. Ipsos president Cliff Young joins us this hour with new polling. And today's jobs number coming in stronger than expected. One week a data point, though, the unemployment rate, especially among black Americans, rising to 5.6%. NAACP president Derek Johnson will be with us. Joe, we're <laughs> nearly at the deadline with yes, a few indeed. days to spare. Luckily, a few days to spare, right? Because if you look at the Treasury cash balance sheet, we are very, very low in terms yes, of the money indeed. they have. So they got it done several days before the X date. I feel like we should have a group hug in the newsroom or something. We finally survived this. Senate passed the bill last night. Looks like the president probably signs it tomorrow. Yeah, so the issue is they're just formalizing how it's going to be delivered mm -hmm. to the Oval Office. But first, he will address the nation. And that'll be at 7 p.m. What an odd, yeah. kind of an odd time to do it. On Friday night, a little, little bit Summer weird. Friday. It's very, it's very warm. Yeah, out. and of course, we'll bring that to you here. That's, as you mentioned, two hours from now. Joining us now around the table to get into all of this as we made it to the end of the week. With our credit intact, Bloomberg congressional reporter Stephen Dennis and Treasury reporter Victoria Dendrinu. Many thanks to both of you for being here. Uh, I'll tell you, we just went through quite a gyration. We came a lot closer than we should have. Do we have anything to show for it? Well, we've got essentially a deal that allows a budget freeze, if you will. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the ink isn't even dry on this thing, and already... Lawmakers on Capitol Hill are plotting how to have a get-out-of-jail-free moment and spend a lot more than they just agreed to spend. Mm -hmm. You know, yesterday in the Senate, one of the things that uh, broke the logjam so they could vote yesterday and have a long weekend is they had a, an agreement on a statement that, you know what, nothing in this plan <laughs> means we can't spend more yeah. on defense, on Ukraine, on fentanyl, on all sorts of national priorities. So... It remains to be seen if Congress is actually going to s stick to these caps or if they're actually going to spend a lot more than these caps in the months to come. There's a lot more fight uh, to happen over the actual details of what they spend money on and not just this, these overall levels. Well, you were in the Senate last night, and what we see is Senators Schumer and McConnell discussing the limit deal but also touting this in terms of their bipartisan fashion. Take a listen. This demanded a bipartisan solution. We knew we'd need to come together for a solution like the one that passed tonight. And so I'm happy to stand here passing this critical legislation to support our families, preserve vital programs, and most importantly, avoid catastrophic default. The deal the House passed last night is a promising step toward fiscal sanity. Uh, but make no mistake, there's much more work to be done. The right to the fight to reel in wasteful spending is far from over. All right, so they're talking about bipartisanship. Maybe it's back in vogue in Washington, D.C. But who do you think won? I, I think if you look at the, the politics of this, Kevin McCarthy needed to have a big top-line number. He wanted to have that $1.5 to $2 trillion number so that he could go to his conference where he's on sort of shaking ground and say, I got a big deal. Uh, he got that. But if you, look, if you look at the actual details of the bill, the White House banked a lot of leverage for the next two years and beyond. You know, we had this situation 12 years ago with Barack Obama. That, that deal with $2 trillion was hard caps for 10 years. The leverage was all with the Republicans, the rest of Obama's presidency. This time around, the hard caps are for two years. And if you look under the hood... A lot of the automatic spending cuts that might take place would actually hit defense. Uh, and so there's a lot of leverage here that Biden can have to ensure 
that he's going to have a pretty smooth sailing between now and the election. Let's hear from the White House. Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre spoke today on the timeline of the bill. The House and the Senate have to do their business, and so we're going to work very quickly with them uh, to get this done, to make sure we can sign it uh, hopefully as soon as, as soon as tomorrow. Uh, but we have to let the House and the, and the Senate do what they need to do so they can get to, to us so the president can sign it. So here we are on a Friday with this finally in the bag here, Victoria. He's going to sign it at some point uh, in the next uh, 24 hours, it looks like. But Fitch still has a credit warning against the U.S., which it brought up, what, about a week ago now at this point. Even in lieu of a deal and seeing the president signing this, is our credit rating still at risk? I mean, I, th I think the rating was expected, and it's, it's just more of a result of the fact that politics can interfere with, you know, the U.S.'s ability to issue debt mm -hmm. um, to such an extent. I mean, we are, I don't know, two days away from what would have been the X, three days away from what would have been the X date. So I think it just reflects the vulnerability of the kind of public finances to the political situation. Mm. And the Treasury Secretary is talking about the fact that if it is signed imminently within the next 24 hours, mm -hmm. they will be okay. But their cash at the moment yeah. is scary low. Yeah, it's exactly like you say. I think the last data from just earlier today shows that it was just under 23 billion, which is pretty, it's a pretty insane number. It's the lowest since 2015, I think. So the first thing Treasury is going to do as soon as it's assigned is to try to restore fiscal operations to kind of a semblance of normality. So just, they're just going to issue a ton of debt. There's an auction on Monday and um, it might be even like in excess of a trillion by the end of the quarter. So we're going to see a lot of debt issuance coming up. We sure are. We're, we're still under extraordinary measures as we speak. When does that actually end? At what point and it will, will, will the secretary make that clear at the time? Um, I don't know that they will make it clear, you know, with an announcement, but the expectation is that as soon as they can go and issue debt and start using that instead of the measures. I mean, there's not a lot of measures left. It's like right. 33, like less than a tenth, I think, left. Um, of what they could spend anyway, but uh, it's just a matter of days or even like hours after Biden signs the, the deal. How concerned is Treasury? And then, Steve, you should weigh in on this, of course, because the fight is not over. It's really just the beginning in terms of potentially a government shutdown. They have to agree on these caps in the appropriations come October 1st. I think for now it's just like we are here in the newsroom, I think just like a big sigh of relief that this was this was resolved, that they're going to focus on like, you know, replenishing the cash pile as soon as possible. You know, maybe there is some concern in markets about what implications it could have with, for liquidity and, you know, the economy is in a bit of a fragile situation. So I think this is more a problem for another day at the moment. So let's get into that for a moment, Steve, because you know, a lot of people are saying that, you know, hey, Mitch McConnell saved this thing. He, you know, he took Lindsey Graham and the defense hawks in the office yesterday, set them straight. But there's an agreement here, to your point, to potentially bust some caps or at least come around uh, on, on some supplemental funding. How painful will the appropriations process be now that the guardrails are in place? Yeah, I think it's going to be very interesting to watch. Uh, you have uh, the Dem Senate Democrats don't want to give this big defense supplemental money to the Republicans without getting some domestic money mm -hmm. in return in the Senate. But then they have to deal with the House. You know, it's not going to be an issue of getting a deal in the Senate. The Senate's good at spending money and cutting deals. But, you know, Kevin McCarthy has cut one big deal, but he does have a backlash on his right wing. And that right wing wants to make, have a lot of riders on these bills. They want to have a lot of demands. It's going to be a real challenge, particularly in the House, to actually pass appropriations bills. But if they don't, this it's is where... Hot. This is where, like, you know, Shalanda Young. Rails. This is where Shalanda Young, the White House Budget Director, in these negotiations, scored some really big wins. Because if the House doesn't get its act together, and you end up with a continuing resolution, defense spending, which the Republicans prize, would be cut by 4.3 percent relative to the caps, and the defense and the domestic doesn't get cut. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're, the Democrats really in the White House are holding a lot of the cards here. And I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on the House to cut deals, to not load this up with a lot of sort of crazy social agenda items. So there's going to be a lot of pressure to make sure they actually do their job and appropriate the funds. This deal also only goes for two years. So do we expect to see extraordinary measures like we did this January in January 2025? I mean, it could well be the case. Um, I think, you know, going in the lead up to the election and... This is more of a political question, but, you know, we, we will hear what plans are for spending and what plans are for 
spending cuts, although I don't think they're going to be much on the trail. And it may, it may be very likely that we end up in this situation again in 2025. Yeah, in, in fact, uh, Garrett Graves, one of the House negotiators, has already said, hey, we get to do this again in two years <laughs> as a positive, right? That they, they see this as, as leverage for them. Yes. And they're telling their conservatives, look, we got one and a half trillion, two trillion this time around. Let's do it again in two years. Um, you know, it's going to be really hard to do that on discretionary spending that, you know, but after the election, you know, the, the, the shift might be towards deficits and towards entitlements, not just, you know, doing the, the easy thing here, which is freezing spending on discretionary accounts. Right. All right. So in two years, we'll see you all again. Our thanks to Can't Bloomberg wait. Steve Dennis and Victoria Denrenu. Coming up on the program, we'll head to the White House for a look ahead to what we'll hear from the president at 7 p.m., just under two hours' time, with senior advisor Gene Sperling. That's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg. There is a gravity, uh, as you all can imagine, of this moment. And so the president wanted to make sure that he addressed the American people directly. And he's going to be speaking clearly uh, from the Oval Office behind the Resolute Desk uh, to the American people for the first time. He just wanted to make sure that the American people understood uh, how important it was to get this done, how important it was to do this in a bipartisan way. Karine Jean-Pierre there. President Biden is gearing up to address the nation in about two hours with a bipartisan debt deal on top of the agenda. Let's go now to the White House and senior advisor to the president, Gene Sperling. Thank you so much for joining us. Is the president planning to come out this evening and claim victory? Well, obviously, the victory you care about is the victory for the American people. And I think I'd stress three things. One, this president said he would be able, even in divided government, even in our partisan, often uh, political system, to work in bipartisan ways to protect the economy, to transform the economy, and yet to protect the, the values he holds most dear, which is having an economy that is fundamentally about working families, about those in need, that builds from the middle out and the bottom up. And I think this is just yet another example of those types of agreements. You saw bipartisan agreements in bipartisan infrastructure, in the CHIPS bill, in the, in the PACT veterans bill. And here again, in one of the most difficult situations, he was able to get a bipartisan agreement that got uh, uh, bipartisan support in both houses, and which we're pleased that Democrats particularly rallied around and supported in overwhelming numbers. Gene, the last time we spoke is about three weeks ago. I checked on Bloomberg Radio. You were very passionate about the prospect of a possible default. Now that we've gone through this whole thing, does it bother you that we went through this agonizing experience to end with no major spending cuts or policy changes? Um, so, first of all, I, I think this was a reasonable bipartisan agreement. What you want is, and what the president stressed, is that default not be on the table, that nobody be using, uh, particularly the Republicans in this context, the threat of default or the, the understanding that the president has to look out for the basic welfare of the American people as a means to mm -hmm. threaten extreme measures. I do think in the end the president felt that Speaker McCarthy negotiated in good faith and that this was an agreement that was close to the type of agreement that you would expect in divided government. But I will be clear that we do not think, you know, we do not think that one should be in any way using uh, uh, you know, budgets or any policy priorities as any type of threat uh, uh, to not raise the debt limit, to put us in default, to crush the economy. So we would have preferred that context never existed. But the president's yeah. so st stringently demanding that default be off the table, I think, had an effect. And I think that you saw from Speaker Jeffries to Schumer to McConnell to McCarthy, you saw in the end, I think they did go along with the president's view that this should be a reasonable bipartisan agreement and not an attempt by anyone to threaten defaulting the economy for the first time in our history unless they got measures that were beyond what they should or would expect to get in a normal bipartisan agreement. 
Well, people are concerned that potentially this sets up a president. And we spoke to Congressman Jim Clyburn of South Carolina yesterday about the debt ceiling and what this could mean for the future and how you all should be looking at it on potential showdowns. Take a listen. We do not need to have this debt ceiling. We need to get rid of it. We should get this vote done and then next week start working on eliminating this debt ceiling. I've been researching this thing ever since I've been in the Congress. This debt limit makes no sense at all. We ought to get rid of it. Congressman Clyburn was really fired up about the debt ceiling. Are you looking into ways to potentially avoid this? The president has signaled he would look into using the 14th Amendment in the future. Well, I think how the president feels is that there was nothing wrong at times in the past with other uh, legislation or budget agreements kind of essentially traveling along or being at the same time uh, uh, as an agreement to raise the debt limit. What happened in 2011 where I had the, you know, was there as a negotiator and saw how close it came was that was the first time we really saw a political party, part, party threatening to default. And I'm happy that after that, for 10 years, that did not happen again. And you did not see Speaker Pelosi doing that the three times that President Trump asked to raise the debt limit. So I think in some ways this was a step backwards because in a, the, they were threatening default. I think the one modification is that in the end, I think the president's call for defaulting off the table and there not being a, a use of extreme uh, uh, demands uh, at the threat of default, uh, you know, did essentially prevail. They did not touch Medicare, Medicaid, mm -hmm. Social Security. They did not get their extreme cuts in the budget they passed. Uh, we protected the Inflation Reduction Act, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, and so many things they proposed that we feared would hurt low income and the most yeah. vulnerable Americans. Gene, I'd like to ask you quickly about the jobs report this morning. Uh, we spoke earlier with your colleague, Dr. Heather Boucher, on the Council of Economic Advisors about the data that we saw. Let's listen. I'd love to have you respond. We are seeing this economy start to, you know, get back to a place that is more sustainable. Um, and, you know, so I think this report today is yet another indication that we are along that path. I think that this kind of report uh, gives us hope that we can see that kind mm -hmm. of, you know, quote unquote, soft landing that people have wanted to see. I know you're hopeful about a soft landing and maintaining a strong job market, but if we put your economist hat on here, Gene, uh, there was a very different read in the household survey, the unemployment rate that we saw rise, and the payrolls number. And if I, wonder, I wonder if that signals to you a shift in the labor market that's making it difficult for all the data to keep up. You know, I think the overwhelming indications of this data... Um, you know, I'll use a different word than, than Heather did, but it is the resilience of this job recovery. I mean, to be in a situation where we've now created over 13 million jobs, where unemployment is still averaging 3.5 percent for this year, uh, uh, at the same time that we're at least seeing headline inflation coming down only 3.3 percent over the last six years, uh, it is yeah. encouraging, and it does show that there has been much more resilience than people uh, projected. I feel like a year ago today I was on, you know, uh, off and on with you or others where people were saying how much people were projecting you know, downturns around the corner. Look, you always have to have humility. We always have to show humility and look at all the data. This differential between the household data and the payroll data, it's not unusual. I do think the payroll data is much more broader, rigorous. It does yep. actually look for results as opposed to what people say. So that's why I think all of us, when it comes to jobs, look at the payroll data. But of course, when you see things that are conflicting, um, you know, you're going to take that into account. But I think on the whole, you have to think that this is showing that this amazing American job machine is continuing. And my last word is yeah. just how terrific the increase in labor force participation is, highest for prime age yeah. in 16 years. That should be very, very encouraging. Well, thank you, Gene. Bringing us inside the data from the North Lawn of the White House, Gene Sperling, we thank you. Coming up, how much did Americans pay attention to the debt ceiling drama? We'll get a sense of that according to new polling next on Balance of Power. This is Bloomberg. This is
is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. Thanks for joining us. The drama over the debt ceiling may be over for now, but a poll from Ipsos taken in May shed some light on how Americans felt about the issue. And to that end, we're joined by Cliff Young, the president of Ipsos. Great to have you here, Cliff. Thank you for coming in. I was asking the question, like many, is it just us obsessing over this or does America actually care and is paying attention? What, no, they what, actually what really, really care. I mean, it's an existential threat, right? Uh, Americans were paying attention to this issue more than any other issue over the last few weeks. And indeed, if you look, if you peel away the onion and look at the polling, you see that a super majority of Americans were worried that there'd be economic calamity. And what do they make of the bipartisanship that took to get to this point? Yeah, they don't put much stock in that. They're all about <laughs> outcomes. They want outcomes, and that outcome is averting an economic crisis. Which we have done, it seems. Are you going to be uh, polling throughout the next couple of weeks to see how people uh, watch this unfold? Because I suspect that, that they actually give fairly high marks to an agreement that came through the center. We will be polling on it, but historically speaking, if you take the 2011 debt ceiling crisis, uh, it was a pox on all your houses. Yeah. Didn't matter who you were, you got negative marks. And so looking forward, I don't think there will be much there. Uh, they're moving on to other issues, like inflation. Mm -hmm. So when you move on to other issues, do you see this being one that really doesn't matter when it comes to the 2024 election? Will this show up in those kind of polls? No, it's one and done. One and done. There are going to be big issues like the economy or sure. immigration or health care. Those are the big issues. Which speaks to our short memories. And this goes for everybody, I think, on this, right? Because there'll be another uh, crisis to talk about by Tuesday, I expect, once we get through the X date. And that's the way these things go traditionally. Yeah, that's the way they are. That's, why cri that's the way crises are, mm -hmm. right? But at the end of the day, those, there are those big, you know, big ticket items like the economy like immigration, that will come around in 2024 and determine who will be in the White House. Well, very interesting polling. We're excited to know that it is uh, at least what you're saying, one and done, potentially. But I, I said guess. it here. Yeah, <laughs> one and done. Should um, we meet back here in two years? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> I, I think this did set the president, though, that this is potentially the path forward anytime you're raising a debt ceiling. Um, Cliff Young of Ipsos, thank you so much for joining us with that polling. Coming up, Derek Johnson, president of the NAACP, will be with us. We're going to be looking at the jobs report that came out earlier today. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg. read these as a strong report, and I think the general tendency of the data has been very much uh, towards saying that the economy, at least for this while, has a fair amount of uh, robustness in it. Former U.S. Treasury Secretary Larry Summers there speaking with Bloomberg's David Weston for Wall Street Week. After no another blowout jobs report today, of course, Bloomberg's Kay Lines is here with more on the data and its implications. Kaylee? Well, Anne-Marie, blowout is almost a delicate way of putting it because what we got on payrolls was 339,000. The average economist estimate was 195,000. So absolutely blew it out of the water. And this actually marked the 14th consecutive monthly report in which the payrolls figure topped economists' expectations. This is a labor market that continually defies expectations in terms of its strength. And of course, that is something that President Biden is very proud of. He actually tweeted earlier today about this report saying that it was a uh, good day for our economy, noting that it, with the 339,000 additions in the month of May, jobs growth uh, since he took office was 13 million. We have to keep in mind that we were coming out uh, of the pandemic, a very unusual economic time. But he went on to say the Biden economic plan is working. As we well know, though, sometimes good news can actually become bad news, especially if it means the economy is proving too strong for the Fed to be successful. 
in its fight against inflation, which brings us to the idea that maybe the Fed is going to need to keep hiking. Interestingly, though, the market doesn't see today's report as feeding into the idea that the Fed is not going to pause in June. Traders seem to think that a July hike after a June pause is really what is more likely here because we have to keep in mind that this data was a, a bit mixed. Yes, you had the blowout on the headline payrolls figure, but the uh, unemployment rate actually went up to 3.7 percent in addition to a cooling in wage growth. And when you look beneath the surface, surface of that unemployment rate at the different racial and ethnic groups in the breakdown. There was only one group that actually saw uh, the unemployment rate go down. That was for Hispanic Americans, but it went up for white and Asian Americans. And the biggest increase was for black Americans, rose from 4.7 percent, which was actually a record low in data going all the way back to the 1970s, up to 5.6 percent. And of course, that is the highest among all these different groups, Joe. Kaylee Lines, many thanks to you. The head of the NAACP is weighing in on the rise in black unemployment and the impact of the debt deal, saying, quote, we demand Congress and the administration end the use of the debt ceiling as an exercise in legislative hostage taking. The well-being of black Americans and vulnerable people should never be negotiated, unquote. Derek Johnson is the president and CEO of the NAACP. And he joins us now. President Johnson, it's good to see you. And thanks for coming back to talk to us on Bloomberg. I know that you as a group and the CBC, for that matter, the Congressional Black Caucus, took a very strident take against the idea of additional work requirements in the original Republican proposal. It's gone through a lot of changes since then. Do you feel more comfortable about what was passed last night? No, I, first of all, we are in full support of not uh, allowing our economy to go off a cliff. Uh, with this fake crisis that was generated, we should never allow a debt ceiling to cause such a panic, not only in our markets, but across the country, particularly for African Americans. Secondly, if there is a need to increase the debt ceiling, we also need to make sure we don't put the, the, the all of the burden on African Americans and working and, and middle class individuals. For example, why are we not talking about increasing taxes on the most wealthiest individuals who are able to pay? Why are we allowing conservatives to shield corporations from standing up to their requirement? And, and the work requirements that was put in place for TANFs are ineffective and would not do anything. We have to be much more focused on protecting our economy, but also growing the middle class and supporting African-American communities so that we can be a more diverse nation. Derek, given how, how, you, how you feel about this, and, you know, we read through more of your comments about this, especially when it comes to accelerating Mountain Valley Pipeline, you're t you call them ineffective work requirements. Should the president be signing this legislation tomorrow? He has to sign a, a legislation because we have co conservatives in the House who are unable to elect a speaker without 15 votes, using the, the economy in this nation's of full faith and credit as hostage so they can advance policy that they did not advance when they had control of the House and the Senate and the president in the White House. Why are they holding this nation hostage now when they could have enacted these legislations when they had full power? Unfortunately, these conservatives are a danger to the safety of our nation with white supremacy. They are a danger to our economy, and they are a danger to the future of this nation. So let's talk about eliminating the debt ceiling for a moment. Uh, President Johnson, I think we're getting maybe a little bit warmer to your feelings on this. It's something we talked to Congressman Jim Clyburn about from South Carolina on the debt ceiling here on Balance of Power. Let's listen to what he said. I did not have to hold my nose at all. Bringing in additional veterans, uh, people uh, who are homeless, they all came into this process. And so I thought that was a real good trade-off. And so I'm very pleased with what the end product uh, is. So he likes the looks of this bill a lot better than the original Republican proposal, but still supports eliminating the debt ceiling. There doesn't seem to be enough support on Capitol Hill to make that happen. Is it something that you will advocate for moving forward? Absolutely. We should not, as a nation, be held hostage uh, full faith and credit is what allow us to be the nation that we are in terms of uh, economic force. And if we continue down this road, you're talking about members of Congress who want to gut the IRS so, so we cannot even collect 
taxes to keep our economy, our nation going. We need to remove this as a tool for them to use and force them as a party to really expand their platform to include more people so they can win elections, as opposed to continue to shrink so small that they're going to destroy this nation and our economy. Derek, the president today also wanted to tout this uh, really impressive jobs report. When you look into the data for black Americans, unemployment for black workers overall rose uh, 5.6% in May from 4.7% in April. How concerned are you about these figures? Well, you think about, but that's down from what it was just four years ago. Uh, having unemployment high numbers is a problem. These are some of the lowest numbers that we've seen in African-American communities for decades, although it is, we have not complete, completely closed the gap. We need to close the gap. But it's not only the level of unemployment, it's the quality of work. And we really need to go deeper to look at what is the quality of work. Far too many African-Americans and Americans have to take on more than one job just to make ends meet. So it's not only unemployment, it's the quality of the work. That's what we're most concerned about. Well, you're also taking a longer view on this than a lot of people are. Uh, in terms of the immediate, we're getting into a presidential election cycle here. What do you want to hear from President Biden when it comes to black jobs in America? I think the quality of jobs is important. But, you know, going beyond jobs, uh, I said this in two, uh, 2020, I said today, the most important issue for African Americans, for, the most important issue for Americans is to save our democracy. I mean, jobs are important. Quality education is important. Access to health care is absolutely crucial. But we had a different place in terms of the discussion around saving our democracy to ensure that all Americans can can really appreciate a quality of life as opposed to the direct attack on our democracy. Those are one of the things I'm hearing over and over in the African-American community. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to be hearing from the president in just under two hours' time now, about 90 minutes. And after he puts this behind him and signs this legislation, it does feel like it's full-on campaign mode into 2024. You held a town hall when he was campaigning nominee Joe Biden. Do you plan to do so again as he looks to 2024? Absolutely. It's not just with the president. We're planning a whole uh, uh, town halls with different candidates who have a, a, a true desire to look at a more inclusive America and one in which we, they can offer up a platform so voters can consider. We're nonpartisan, but we're political in the sense that when there's a direct threat to our communities, we address that as well. Just quickly, Derek, who? Who else are you thinking about hosting town halls with? Well, it's, it's kind of open now. Let, let's see who qualifies. Let's get into ag the aggressive campaign season, and let's begin to have those conversations. You mean Republicans and Democrats? Absolutely. All right. We're looking forward to tuning in. Our thanks to Derek Johnson, president and CEO, of course, of the NAACP. Thank you for your time this evening. Coming up, the White House says President Biden could side the bill, suspending the debt ceiling as soon as tomorrow. And we'll hear from the president in just under 90 minutes. Our political panel weighs in next. From Washington, this is Balance of Power. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. The debt ceiling agreement is heading towards President Biden's desk just before a June 5th default deadline. For more, let's bring in our political panel this evening, Jeannie Shanzano, Iona University political science professor, and Sarah Chamberlain, Republican Main Street Partnership president and CEO. Okay, we have to start with you, Sarah. Okay. You're taking a bit of a victory lap on this show. Yes. <laughs> you said this was how it's going to go down. So does... Kevin McCarthy claim victory now? Does this give Absolutely. him some leeway into the rest of the year to make sure he keeps a hold of his gap? Absolutely. Ball? It was a great victory. And it's the first time in history you've had a debt increase, ceiling increase, at the same time you've had cuts. Um, so we're thrilled. I mean, it was, it was a great deal. I think it gives Kevin a lot of power. I think he, ma he managed it very well. He worked very closely with the Republican Main Street Partnership members mm -hmm. to do that. And this was not a surprise. So. Framing these as cuts, though, does sort of require a little bit of a qualifier, right? They're certainly not the cuts that Republicans wanted. He lost the Freedom Caucus mm -hmm. on that issue. And now we're hearing about Lindsey Graham, you know, 
bursting caps here on defense and kind of right. finding ways to work right. around a lot of these. Can we actually tell people with a straight face that this cuts the budget? Absolutely. Uh, without, death, without question, it does. Yeah. And, and I, I can't speak for what's going on with kind of the other Republicans, but our members are pleased. Um, if they feel strongly that does cut the budget, it obviously doesn't cut, uh, touch Medicare, Medicaid, which they promise, and Social Security, but it does cut in other areas, and we have to begin to cut somewhere. Um, We're kind of you know, eating we, around the edges here, though, right? Yeah, I mean, we but talked it's, about this. it's we a didn't, start. We didn't want to talk about the big stuff, Social Security, right. Medicare. Right. And that's a conversation that we're going to have to have. But, but maybe we can have that in a bipartisan way now because yeah. you saw what yeah. happened with this. I mean, this is a victory, and you saw over 300 members come together. The far left and the far right did what they do, but the rest of the men and women came together. Mm -hmm. So maybe we, could, this will, we can move this forward into other issues. We certainly hope so. Well, I think straight. that's what the president is going to talk about this evening. He's going to claim his own victory, but Jeannie, of course, he's going to want to talk about the fact that he's been in the Senate, he's done these deals for years, and he loves bipartisanship. Do you expect him to come out and claim this victory tonight? And I got to ask, Jeannie, why is he doing it 7 p.m. on a beautiful Friday evening? Yeah, it, it, you know, I think he had had two really good stories today. One are these very impressive job numbers, and the other is the deal on the debt ceiling. And so he does want to take a victory lap on both of those. Tonight, I know it's going to be 7 p.m., um, but the reality is he sees these as intimately connected. You know, the president has long said that the good job numbers are the result of the work he has been doing, and he believes that with this debt ceiling deal, he protects the programs that he put in place to the best of his ability. And so he's going to take a victory lap on those. This is also going to be, I think, the kickoff for him, the real kickoff of his 2024 campaign, because the reality is we're not going to see that much more legislating out of Washington, D.C. this year before the election in the next year and a half. So we're very much going to be moving, I think, tonight into campaign mode. And the president is going to lead that charge, making the case to the American people of the good job he has done. He did what he promised to do, which was to govern from the middle, to make deals, to keep his head down, and to deliver for the American public. So today feels like a good day for him to make this case. Well, I think I know what your answer is going to be here, Jeannie. If we're, if we're winding up in a big campaign mode, I, I imagine that Joe Biden's not going to be motivated to come back around with some sort of a commission or a study or whatever it might be to take a bipartisan approach to dealing with the debt ceiling, to maybe having a conversation, a grown-up talk about Social Security and Medicare that were quick to come off the table. We're just going to do this all over again in two years then, right? That's right. And, you know, much to my dismay, because I've long been advocating do something about the debt ceiling, get rid of it, or certainly when you appropriate money, make sure you're going to pay for it. We should not be using the debt ceiling to do the work of appropriating and spending our money. So, you know, it's reckless to do it should not have been done. You don't hold the government hostage or the, the full faith and credit of the United States hostage. But the president doesn't seem like he's going to go there tonight because in this deal, they got the two years. And to your point, Joe, we will all be back at it again yeah. in March 20, or January 2025 in the lame duck. Sarah, can you see any Republicans getting on board with getting rid of the debt ceiling in terms of an issue? So Potentially, if it's done, if it's done in, a, in a way that they agree with, you know, a little compromise, yeah, I could see that. Because they don't like doing this either. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is an exercise and, you know, time and, and they, got, they had to come back and it's Lots tough. Lots of bad pizza. And, I mean, oh, I was right. going to say something else, but it, it's, it's a tough, I mean, it's a tough few weeks for these guys. So I think that they would be open to it if, if there's real reform around it. Right. And I remember the super cuts. committee in 2011. I remember that. And what that left us with. And yeah. It does, it does leave many skeptical that some blue ribbon commission is going to fix mm -hmm. this. Right. right. I agree. Yeah. We'll but we have, can have hope. We'll have our reality check on Monday. <laughs> Coming up, Chick-fil-A and Target. You heard about that and a lot of others in the spotlight here. Can you say Anheuser-Busch? Corporations facing growing pressure over their positions on social issues. We'll hit that next with our political panel. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg. Our message to policymakers is: um, let business do business, and they, you know, they they should get to decide how they treat 
their customers and their employees. Uh, and then most of the CEOs say, you know, if I'm allowed to do that, I, I don't feel that I need to get into extraneous political issues. It's Josh Bolton, the Business Roundtable CEO and former Chief of Staff to President George W. Bush with us here on Balance of Power yesterday, talking about the mounting pressure facing companies over what some call woke culture. You've seen the boycotts on social media. For more, we welcome back our political panel, Jeannie Shanzano, Iona University political science professor, and Sarah Chamberlain, Republican Main Street Partnership president and CEO. Uh, this is confounding in some cases, certainly in the case of Chick-fil-A, which is not exactly a darling of the left. I think we all know about uh, their politics, their stand on LGBTQ, but someone found a DEI page, I guess, uh, with, with their policy on inclusion and, and moved on a boycott. We've seen it uh, against Target and a number of other retailers, including Walmart, for their Pride Month displays. Right. And it's, it's kind of interesting that this seems to be a relatively new phenomenon. It's fueled by social media. Mm -hmm. And apparently it doesn't even matter exactly what the companies do. Right, apparently not. I, I agree with Josh Bolton. I mean, let the companies run their businesses. And you're right, Chick-fil-A, I mean, they're closed on Sundays. I mean, they really were the darling. I have no idea where this is coming from. I mean, probably Twitter or something mm -hmm. like that. But we really, what does woke even mean? I mean, if you ask most people, they, they don't even know what the definition is, but they just keep hearing that word. Yeah. So we need to move on from this, let people be people, shop where you want, and, and stop just doing this. Do you think some it's of this waste is of time. instigated, though, by the political climate? Given the fact that, I mean, Ron DeSantis in Iowa, I don't know how many times he said, I'm going after wokeism. Right. But then he can't, but nobody can describe it. If you get the politicians on TV and you ask them what, give us a definition, many of them stumble. I would even actually stumble. I think it means something different to each, each person. Yeah. But Josh Bolton's right. Let these corporations do what they have to do, make their employees happy, and, and just move on. I mean, that's what America used to be. Jeannie, so much of this seems to play uh, against the response from the company that we're talking about. Bud Light would be the example of how not to do it uh, with this kind of uh, vague response that didn't include an apology or even address what they did. They talked about America having a beer together or something like that. Target was a little different. They actually moved uh, some of their of their products to the back of the store or out of the store in some cases. Walmart took it differently. They said, yeah, we do. We sell products for a lot of different groups, and this is the way we do business. No real impact there. So it, it does seem uh, to hinge on the way that these corporate communications offices handle a boycott. Yeah, it does. And to a certain extent, this is not unexpected. In 2020, the Supreme Court says that under the Civil Rights Act, you cannot be discriminated against based on your sexual identity. And that is what drove some of this. But the other part of this is, is that Americans have been much more accepting of the trans LGBTQ community and marketing companies are looking at that. And so they are using that and saying, hey, we can advertise on this as well. And the other part of this is, quite frankly, dot. That was an issue, the role was an issue that animated Christian conservatives for five decades. Now that is gone and they are struggling to find another way to gin up turnout in the primary. And so you see a lot of far right groups looking at this as a potential way to do that. But the reality is they weren't so successful in doing that in 2022. And they tried. That was less a tsunami and more of a ripple for the far right. And you may see that again in 2024, because very few Americans list transgender issues in the top of the issues they care most about. 5% for that versus upwards of 52% for the economy. So those numbers right there tell you that it is not an issue that's going to animate a lot of voters in a general, but in the primary, huh. maybe it will. And so they use that to their advantage. Great numbers. Well, are we going to be seeing more of this? We're 500, more than 500 days away from the 2024 election. I would expect, yes. The governor of California, Gavin Newsom, this is what he had to say. No American wants to live outraged about something new every day, even, quote, woke chicken. <laughs> um, Sarah, do <laughs> moderate Republicans need to play in this no. woke culture no. game? The, the, the conservative Main Street Partnership members are really focused on what's going on, helping their finances, trying to deal with inflation. They're not playing this game. They're trying to help uh, Main Street America and, and the needs that they want. I mean, she's right with the polling that this poll's so low. Um, and, and there's a lot of issues facing this country, including mental health. 
I mean, there's a lot going on in our families that the Main Street members are focused on. And you have to imagine things like this actually affect people's mental health. All right, Jeannie Shanzano and Sarah Chamberlain agreeing there at the end on this Friday evening. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, that does it for Joe and I. Of course, the president will be speaking in about an hour's time. And all of these stories and more as we head into default day on Monday on the Washington Edition newsletter on the terminal and online. Let's hope it's not. Have a great weekend. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg.